and welcome to this week's episode of Bigfoot for Breakfast, home of the mysterious and the macabre, where we sit in the studio every week challenging conventional thought. While you're here, make sure you hit the subscribe button on whichever app you're listening from, and while you're at it, please also leave a rating and a review based on your opinion of the show after you've listened to a few episodes. We love your feedback, and it helps us out a lot. If you didn't catch our Facebook announcement on Leap Day, we announced the winner of our most recent contest. To enter this contest, all you had to do was invite some friends to like our Facebook page and leave us a rating and a review on your podcast app. Screenshot it and then post it as a comment on the contest post of our Facebook page. The winner of this contest was, drumroll, can you drumroll? Christina Emmert, who won a Bigfoot for Breakfast t-shirt or a glitter mug. Which did she, did she tell you what she chose? Oh, I thought this one was just a glitter mug, I guess. No, they had a choice. Okay. Christina. Christina, what do you want? Christina, what do you want? What do you want? You want a, you want a t-shirt? What do you want from me? You, you want, want a mug? You want a coffee, coffee cup? cup? <laughs> it's got glitter. A coffee cup? A you, cup for you your coffee? Let us know what you, what you're wanting. All right. Let us know. Congratulations, Christina. And Christina, she's she listens to us every week, doesn't she? Yeah. She gives good feedback, too. She's awesome. So we're pretty happy. We would have been happy with any of you because all of you are pretty awesome. But Christina, she's a good girl. Thanks for following. Yes, indeed. Make sure you stay caught up on all of your episodes and follow us on almost all major podcast social media platforms, Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, and Twitter for contest announcements, general information, photos, and funny memes. And they are funny. We do pride ourselves in the memes that we come across and yes, share. <laughs> They're funny. They are so funny. They are funny. I mean, I laugh for a good five minutes before I post it typically. Me alone. too. And then I continue laughing and then randomly go back and look at it and laugh some more. Yep. We also want to take a few minutes to let you in on some recommendations that we have for some other shows. We know a few that may pique your interest. The Question Everything guys, Semperfy Rob, Sean, and The Mick host a show where they pick a different topic every week that usually seems to coincide with issues that we seem to be facing at the time as American people, and they discuss it. They usually do a Facebook Live every Saturday, and then they'll post the edited version to the podcast platforms a few days later. They also take call-ins from guests who have anything to say regarding the topic that week. So if you can relate in some way or have an opinion, get on their Facebook Live and give them a call and and chat them up for a while. MWP is another show that you guys should check out. Chach and Josh are funny and their conversations flow really well. They talk a lot about movies, wrestling, politics, whatever else comes up through the episode with a lot of jokes and a lot of great personality. So check them out. You won't regret it. The Kensington Corner with Tom and Jeff is another great show. They tackle the problems of the world one thing at a time, but they focus a lot on health and overall well-being, both mentally and physically, from a man's standpoint. And we found their show to be really interesting because they aren't afraid to really get into the everyday struggles that guys face, especially with mental health and stress. It's a really honest show, and one of them is a veteran, so they promote various causes associated with the mental health of veterans as well, which we think is incredible because it's a very important topic and our nation's veterans don't get the love and support that they deserve. Any conversation that can be had about how to improve that is fantastic. Now that we've got all that stuff out of the way, let's get down to business. I thought that was the business. The business of birthing babies. Like, this is the fun part. That was the business. Get done with the business and do the fun stuff. The other business. The birth and babies stuff. But I don't know nothing about birthing no babies. Well, that's weird because you've done it <laughs> three times. <laughs> so you should probably know a thing or two. I tuned it all out in my memory. You're a nurse in an ER. So you should kind of know a lot. Okay. I'm going to go ahead and address that fallacy right now about ER nurses because right? <laughs> I am terrified of that. <laughs> like if you come into the ER and you are going to have a baby, I'll be calm on the outside, but I am really scared on the inside. Don't do it. <laughs> don't come to me with a baby problem. If you plan on multiplying, don't come to me. I am not. I'm not that kind of nurse. <laughs> Don't, don't do well, it. Well, luckily for you, in all of your baby birthing experience, you've never had one stolen by fairies and replaced with a monster. Are you sure? Because... <laughs> Well, there was that one. There's one. <laughs> <laughs> Apparently, that is a thing. So, uh, let's take a deep dive into European folklore and discuss the phenomena of changelings. Story time. Imagine, you carry a child, you're growing it, nourishing it, loving it for 40 weeks, hopefully. You endure the pain of labor and the joy of looking upon the face of your child for the first time. I do want to interject here that preemie babies are more likely to be stolen 
by fairies. You care for and nurture this child. You lovingly place your child in its crib and go to bed. You wake in the morning, enter the nursery to check on and feed your baby. You approach the crib, and when your eyes meet the tiny little being lying in your baby's bed, it is not the baby you placed there the night before. What? (laughs) I love how you crack yourself up. So it's not the baby. An Irish poet named W.B. Yeats. Yeet. <laughs> I thought the same thing. Spoke of these nightmarish legends in an 1889 poem entitled The Stolen Child. How appropriate. Come away, O oh human child, to the waters and the wild, with the fairy hand in hand, for the world is more full of weeping than you can understand. According to lore, based mostly from Scottish or Irish origin, a changeling is the offspring of a fairy or elf, some say trolls, which is left behind to replace a human offspring which has been stolen. What? They stole the baby! (laughs) (laughs) He stole our black root. (laughs) Name that movie. The lore suggests multiple reasons for which the human child may be stolen. To replace an ill or ugly fairy child. To gain nourishment from the human mother's milk. But according to Encyclopedia Britannica, it is most commonly suggested in legend that the child's purpose is to strengthen the fairy stock. But it has also been suggested that other uses for the human child may be for the fairies to feed on or to be given to the devil as a tithe to hell according to some Scottish lore. This may have been a method of punishing the humans for looking upon the fairy kind and their world with disrespect. That's a good punishment. Let's snatch your baby. It's not all gloom and doom, however. Some version of changeling lore mentioned the love some fairies had for human babies, considering them to be quite beautiful. It was the prettiest, best-natured babies that were stolen to be raised as their very own. Of course, then, these beautiful babes were replaced by the ill-mannered and less attractive fairy babies, or sometimes not even babies at all. Some legends suggest that the babies were replaced by older fairies that had perhaps been cast out or rejected by their own kind. In other fairy tales, the babies would be replaced by an enchanted piece of wood, which resembled a baby. Eventually, though, the magic would fade and the baby would appear to become ill, wither, and die. But rather than a corpse, all that would remain was a rotting mess of wood. That's odd. It's very magic. Uh, Totally magic. Very magic. On the reverse end of the legends and lore, it's rumored that a large portion of fairy births do not end with the survival of the child. And those that do often result with deformed, grotesque, and diminutive babies which are unwanted and rejected by the adult fairies as they are supposedly aesthetically vain. The result of this distaste for the homely and unhealthy attempts are made to swap them for human babies which are more pleasing both in appearance and temperament. The most susceptible target to be exchanged with a changeling is a baby who is very highly admired or has yet to be baptized. As we mentioned before, it may not necessarily be a fairy baby which replaces the human child that is taken. So do you think this is kind of a story made up just so people will get their kids baptized back in the day? I'm sure that part of it is intended to encourage that, but I give a lot of other alternative explanations. Okay. From the sounds of it, the exchange is likely not to go unnoticed as fairy changelings are often described as having withered features and yellow parchment-like skin. They may also have dark eyes, physical deformities such as a lame hand, unnaturally scrawny legs, and a crooked back. Other features which are described in changeling lore are a light coat of downy hair and a full set of teeth. In utero, they have like a little light coat of fur, so sometimes it's not abnormal for babies to have that when they're born. Right. Sometimes they are hairy. And I mean, to be honest, like, yeah. they just kind of are. And also, I mean, there is the rare occasion that babies are born with a full set of teeth. However, later on, the babies lose the teeth and they're they're not healthy. And then they're more likely to have unhealthy adult teeth as well. Right. It's a really rare occurrence. So while the appearance sounds like enough to disturb even the most tolerant and accepting of mothers, it's their temperament that is most likely to give away the changeling. Unlike the giggly and pleasant demeanor of their average chubby baby, the fairy substitute is known for being unhappy and nearly impossible to please, howling and screeching at all hours. According to lore, the sound and frequency of the changeling's tantrums exceed the constitutions of any mere mortal. Changelings are known for their ravenous appetites, 
eating any and all that it can get. As we had talked about, this little devil may have both teeth and claw-like little fingers. And legends indicate that it will eat food as an adult human would, a much more advanced diet than its appearance would indicate was appropriate, and does not nurse from the breast like a human infant would. I don't know if I'd want it to from the sounds of it. (laughs) When it has consumed the meal set before it, it will demand more and more. These nasty little creatures have been known to empty the house of all edible content and remain still unsatisfied. However, changelings continue to appear malnourished no matter how much it devours. So the situation is really just awful pretty much for all parties involved. You've got every aspect of your life going wrong and now your ugly ass baby is eating you out of house and home and still won't stop crying. This sounds like a recipe for disaster. (laughs) It's not funny. It's not. It is. It is. <laughs> so baby. That's what you say. When, oh, your baby's so cute. If it's really cute, but if it's not cute, you just say, oh, it's the baby. <laughs> anyway. Along with its constant torture through sheer unpleasantness, the beast baby also brings with it an unfortunate run of bad luck for the poor family who is cursed to host it. So, not only are they forced to contend with a constant malcontent of an insatiable hunger of the fairy, they must do it under most likely dire financial circumstances and even more stress from the unyielding misfortune raining down on them every step of the way in all aspects of life. Apparently, the changeling phenomena is not limited strictly to baby snatching. It's possible for a fairy devil to replace your husband as well. Meh. Making him more snarky and cantankerous than usual. Dang it. Hey, maybe you should look into that, Sarah. Well, I mean, I like him, but he is a snarky he's and cantankerous. Can- <laughs> maybe he's been replaced. Derek, have you been replaced? Blink twice for yes. We're going to have to do a test. Are they still in there a little bit, or is it completely replaced? No, it's completely replaced. It's like not even them anymore. But wait until you read how to test. Okay. We're going to do it. I'll tell you. We'll put it on TikTok. Well, actually, technically, he already has. He's lit his own head on fire. An adult. (laughs) Story time. (laughs) Time. (laughs) An adult who has been replaced by a changeling may suddenly have no interest in his or her friends or family, will be cold, ill-natured, and apathetic, perhaps even confrontational. Fight me. (laughs) Maybe I'm a changeling. <laughs> no, you've been like this for as long as I can remember. I don't know, because when you were little, I remember them talking about how cute and sweet you were. And you are not now. Now I hate everyone. Now you're mean. I'm an equal opportunity hater. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so, as with a baby changeling, the sudden change in personality is a telltale sign that your man is snatched up and replaced. Alas. As legend has it, it is the fairer sex who is most often the victim of being swapped out by a changeling often around the time of pregnancy or childbirth, which has some pretty interesting implications that we'll discuss later. It's likely that these women are unbaptized or do not attend church. Crap. (laughs) It's possible that the women themselves were held in order to birth healthy and maybe pretty babies for the fairies who were otherwise unable to do so for whatever reason, like corrupted genetics, infertility, or whatever. In the case of the wife swap, the woman's personality would suddenly change and a loving, caring wife will suddenly become a nagging shrew, according to these types of tales. I feel like this is made up by a guy, because over time, guys piss women off. They're preach so frustrating, and then some guy made this up because he didn't want to take the blame for why his wife is you tired of shit. This is justification for killing his wife because... I mean, up until the 19th century, suspicion of fairy magic is like completely legitimate justification for murder. Now, I have to kind of go back to you because, I mean, it goes both ways. I shouldn't say guys piss women off, but you can't blame. It's like a guy, you know what girls have talked about when they're mad at their husband and then suddenly their husband's like, is it that time of the month? It's like, don't blame that time of the month for something that you have done. It's you. Homeboy's back on his bullshit. Right. Like the babies, the woman is replaced by either a female fairy or also possibly a piece of enchanted wood, in which case the piece of wood bearing her likeness would be presumed dead eventually and would be buried once the magic wore off. Okay, so I'm going to get this straight. They come to the crib of the baby and there is a piece of wood carved in the shape of a baby. It's not alive. they don't see that it's wood. The enchantment makes it look like it's a baby, but slowly... The enchantment wears off, and so the baby gets more lethargic, and it gets it looks sick and ill and just starts withering away, and then the baby dies. And then, if they bury the baby, and then if they were to, like, exhume it, 
later, all they would find was wood. Okay, so to the mom, it looks like a baby, but what about to the townsfolk? Is she carrying around a log? I know. <laughs> I don't know. That's pretty. I, you know, I didn't. I don't know if the magic extends to everyone. If it's just to the mom. Well, something, something to Google. Something for the Google. Mm-hmm. Shall we share some short, sh- some <laughs> some short, short stories? <laughs> <laughs> some short stories or accounts that were written in regard to changeling encounters? I think so. That's do. Sam read through quite a significant number of short stories, poems, and whatnot during this research for the episode, and she found some cool little tales. Let's be honest, I'm going to share some of the shortest ones with the least amount of archaic language, which is great. The Glengarry Fairy by James McDougall is just one exactly like that and goes as follows. There once lived in Glengarry a widow with a young child who was a boy. One day she went to the well for water, and when she was returning to the house, She heard the child, whom she had left sleeping quietly in the cradle, screaming as if he were in great pain. She hastened in and gave him a drink as quickly as she could. This quieted him for a little while, but he soon broke out again as badly as ever. She gave him another drink, and while he was at her breast, she looked at him and saw that he had two teeth in his mouth, each more than an inch long, and his face was old and withered as any face she had ever seen. She said to herself, Now I am undone, but I will keep quiet until I see what will come of this. Next day, she lifted the lad in her arms and put a shawl around him, and went away as though she was going to the next farm with him. A bugbear ran across her path, and when she was going over the ford, the creature put its head out of the shawl and said, Many a big fold have I seen on the banks of this stream. The woman did not wait to hear more of his story, but threw him into a deep pool below the ford, where he lay for a while, tumbling about and reviling her, and saying if he had known beforehand the trick that she was going to play him, he would have shown her another. She then heard a sound like a flock of birds flying about her. She saw nothing until she looked at her feet, and there beheld her own child with the bones as bare as the tongs. She took him home with her and got gradually better and was at last as healthy as any other child. I do want to throw in a couple more little stories here just because I feel like some of the way that these changeling babies are described and the way that they're regarded and treated is relevant to some of the discussion later. So this next little story is called A Pisky Changeling by W.Y. Evans Wentz from a 1911 publication of the Fairy Faith in Celtic Countries. A woman who lived near Bree's church had a fine girl baby. She thought the Piskies came and took it and put a withered child in its place. The withered child lived to be 20 years old and was no larger when it died than when the Piskies brought it. It was fretful and peevish and frightfully shriveled. The parents believed that the Piskies used to come and look over a certain wall by the house to see the child, and I heard my grandmother say that the family once put the child out of doors at night to see if the Piskies would take it back again. Okay, so this next little one is from Thomas Johnson Westdrops, a study of folklore on the coast of Connacht, Ireland. And I included this one specifically as it addressed an adult having been the changeling. A man whose young wife had long been childless taunted her, and she soon after bore a lovely boy. One day, to his horror, it suddenly grew a long beard, and he beat his wife, at whose screams two red-capped women came and beat him till he asked pardon. The real child was sent a tuft of rushes to the mother, and she was able to enter the fairy palace. An old woman brought her to the king and said she was the nurse of his own son. He restored her own child and said the man who beat her was a fairy disguised as her husband. She invoked God's name and fell senseless, eventually recovering and returning home to find she had been three years absent. She found that her husband had detected the changeling and put it on the fire when it shrieked and flew up the chimney. All right, so now that we all have a general idea about some of these stories and lore, let's discuss how you get your people back, if you are able. So this is where it gets really interesting. In my reading, I've come across many methods of bringing the changeling to light and even managing an exchange of the changelings and bringing the real child back. 
Some of these methods, though, are disturbingly and horribly violent. Often in these tales or poems, the changeling can be tricked into divulging its identity. One of the more common methods of trickery I found in the changeling stories is pretending to cook the family meal inside of a single eggshell instead of a pot or pan. This causes confusion in the changeling, and it would recite the following rhyme. Acorn before oak I knew, and an egg before hen. But never before have I seen an eggshell brew dinner for a harvestman. Or something along those lines. The important element being that it would end up revealing itself as a changeling and as a result of its confusion and curiosity about the odd behavior of the human mother. After its cover is blown, it's forced to flee the human world and go back to its own kind. Subsequently, the stolen human baby has to be returned to its family. Okay, so here's where it takes a turn for the morbid. Macabre. A changeling can also be revealed by holding the baby over a hot stove. Wow. Also, much like the test for revealing a witch, you can hold the baby underwater. Wow. In a society where superstition dominates education, these acts, under the suspicion of the presence of a changeling, justifies these methods of mistreatment and torture of a child. Wow. Wow. According to a 2018 article by psychologist Stuart Weiss, There was a case in March of 1863 in which a coroner in New York City was investigating the suspicious death of a three-year-old, the gender of which was not reported. The New York Times covered the story and reported that the mother of the child, Mary Nell, was told by a previous tenant that the house where she lived with her child had within it a presence of fairies. Having been raised in Ireland, the lore was common knowledge and she regarded it as a sign that her child may have been exchanged for a fairy child. Her knowledge of this lore had taught her that the test for rooting out a changeling was to make the child sit on the blade of a shovel which had been heated until it was red hot. Oh my gosh. If the child were in fact a changeling, according to the legends, it would reveal its true identity by flying away and her own child would be returned to her. Mrs. Nell's husband, the father of the child, was completely unaware of her suspicions and was unaware when she took it upon herself to subject her child to this test. The burns that the child endured from this act were so severe that after a week of living in agony, the child died. According to Vice's article, Mr. Nell's testimony against his wife included a statement alluding to a history of his questioning his wife's sanity related to some of her behaviors in the past. Unfortunately, there were many cases like this one. Vice speculates that parents have high expectations of childbirth and when their children don't meet these expectations, parents sometimes find a different demon to blame. That's kind of what I was thinking. You know, we didn't know a lot about what can go wrong with babies. And every every mother has an idea in their head of what their baby is going to be like. You know, sweet and happy and cuddly. And then they get extremely colicky or just fussy and hard to deal with. They don't expect that first time motherhood is going to be so freaking hard because it is. They have to blame something. And then they burn their baby's butts, apparently. Oh, my God. Carol Silver's book, Strange and Secret Peoples, discusses the use of foxglove baths to kill changelings. What is a foxglove bath? Um, It's poison. Ah. So there is a reported incident in Wales from 1857 and in Donegal in 1870s and 1890s, where there was a case in Scotland in which a baby who was considered to be ill-tempered and would not stop crying was thrown onto hot coals. According to the classical scholar Gilbert Murray, in Ireland, in my own lifetime, a child who was for some reason reputed to be a changeling was beaten and burned with irons, the mother being locked out of the room while the invading fairy was exorcised, though unfortunately the child died in the process. I don't know if I can talk about this stuff. This is awful. Another story from Richard Sugg's book discusses an April 1840 case in which a man, James Mahoney, became convinced by his neighbors that his own six-year-old son, John, had been exchanged by a fairy. These suspicions arose in relation to a curvature in his spine, which had caused John to be bedridden for the better part of two years. So, scoliosis? Oh my gosh. In addition to the perception that he was an unusually intellectual child, it was in the month of April of that year that Mr. Mahoney and his merry band of neighbors stripped the boy to nearly naked and held him over a hot shovel as they threatened to sit him upon it. That was not the only threat made to poor John that night by his father and neighbors. They drug him to the water pump and threatened to drown him under it if he did not reveal himself as a changeling and return the real John Mahoney. He was so terrified by their threats that he confessed to being a fairy, telling them that he would send back the real John the very next evening if they agreed to allow him the night's lodging. He went so far as to detail that the real John was located in a farmer's house, wearing 
wearing corduroys and a green cap. When the next morning came, the poor kid was found to have died in bed through the night. His death very well may have been the result of his spinal condition, as was determined by a doctor at the time. However, is it possible that his sudden and untimely death was the result of fear? Yeah. Okay, so at this point, I feel like we've painted a pretty vivid picture of the lore, the stories, some of which are based on reality and others are thought to be at least based loosely on truth or the perception of an incident that occurred based on the level of understanding at the time. So if these legends are based on truth, let's break them down and explore what the reality of the situation may have been without the misinterpretation of the situation based on superstitious beliefs and a lack of knowledge, basically. So let's start with the discussing of the time frame in which these children are perceived to be at their most vulnerable. Very shortly after birth, and more so, if they have yet to be named or baptized. What are some things that could have caused a baby who was born normally to suddenly have a change in appearance or behavior? One of the descriptions of the changeling babies, which is a recurring theme in many of the stories, is a yellowish skin. Mm -hmm. Jaundice is actually pretty common and a well-known and easily treated condition that occurs in babies within the first few days of birth. The cause of jaundice is the buildup of bilirubin, which is released when used red blood cells break down. Infants produce more bilirubin than adults do, as they produce red blood cells at a much faster rate than adults do. And those cells break down in greater numbers, which result in a significant amount of the yellowish pigment. The yellowing of the skin and sclera, or whites of the eyes, is the result of this buildup, and with treatment, is a relatively harmless condition. Unless you're an alcoholic. There are other more emergent causes of jaundice in infants, such as enzyme deficiencies, liver malfunction, viral or bacterial infections, which were likely common at the time period that fairy lore ran rampant, sepsis, internal bleeding, and red blood cell abnormalities that may cause them to break down more rapidly than normal. According to mayoclinic.org, babies who are at the greatest risk for developing jaundice are those who were born prematurely, before 38 weeks, as their bodies aren't developed enough to process the bilirubin properly, as well as the babies who experience significant bruising during birth. Which, if you think about it, at this time, you know, a lot of these babies are born at home with no expert guidance, no education of any kind necessarily on how to birth them. So damage is going to happen. That's true. If there's an incompatibility or difference between the mother's blood type and the baby's blood type, antibodies received by the baby from the mother through the placenta may cause an abnormally rapid breakdown of red blood cells as well. Babies who breastfeed are also more likely to become jaundiced, and breastfeeding would have been the primary or likely only option for women during this time period. Babies who were not nursing well or were not getting enough nutrition from nursing are likely to develop jaundice as a result of dehydration and low caloric intake. So if you think of the time period we're looking at, what's the likelihood that some of these impoverished and likely underfed women are producing enough nutrition for their babies? So let's take a specific condition and run with it. Now we have a baby who was born looking perfectly healthy, who suddenly develops the yellowish tint to its skin and eyes. Now for us, the treatment for this condition seems so easy. But how would these people have known? So without the proper treatment, the buildup can become toxic, resulting in a condition called acute bilirubin encephalopathy, which is the result of the bilirubin building up in the brain. So what, pray tell, are the symptoms for this condition? Well, by God, backward arching of the neck and back, crooked spine, high-pitched crying, or the insatiable screaming that was discussed earlier, poor nursing, fever, and listlessness. In the event that this condition causes permanent damage, it can cause improper development of tooth enamel, cerebral palsy, which includes vol involuntary movements, and hearing loss. So the most common treatment of jaundice is light therapy, which helps break down the bilirubin so it may be excreted through urine and feces. If babies spent time out in the sunlight with their parents, or say, their parents left the child outside so that the fairies would return the real one, it's possible, in some cases, the condition resolved which made the parent believe that their real child had been returned. Interesting. Let's look at some other conditions that may have caused the mother to believe magic had adversely touched or changed her child. Williams syndrome is a disorder that had been identified in the 1960s and was originally called elfin face syndrome, as the physical and behavioral similarities shared by people with Williams and storybook elves are apparent to researchers. It's even possible that people born with this syndrome may have been the real-world inspiration for the fictional characters. According to a 2000 
2017 article by Jennifer Latson. Children diagnosed with this disorder have similar features including a small upturned nose, long philtrum or upper lip length, wide mouth, full lips, small chin, and puffiness around the eyes. Blue and green eyed children with Williams syndrome can have a prominent starburst or white lacy pattern on their iris. Facial features become more apparent with age, and the description is from an article. This description is from an article on williamsyndrome.org. Other characteristics of this disorder is low birth weight, slow weight gain, and failure to thrive. This is another element that is common among changeling lore, along with poor feeding as a result of decreased muscle tone, severe gag reflex, and lack of ability to properly suck and swallow. Another condition, regressive autism, can cause a child to appear to develop normally in their early years and develop symptoms of autism later, which makes it another viable genetic condition which was thought to mark a changeling child, as is prater willi syndrome, or PWS. In newborns, the symptoms of this disorder present as weak muscles, poor feeding, and slow development, according to Wikipedia. Other physical traits are lack of eye coordination, a prominent nasal bridge, small hands and feet with tapering fingers and almond-shaped eyes. So you're getting a lot of these physical characteristics that they're describing. And in the early stages of childhood, a person with this diagnosis is constantly hungry, which often leads to obesity. While the constant hunger is a common element of changeling lore, the weight gain isn't necessarily a common trait among the supposed fairy imposters. However, children with this disorder also display mild to moderate intellectual impairment as well as behavioral problems, which does fit the changeling bill. Another common element you see as far as physical traits in changeling babies as depicted in artwork is a tail. The more severe forms of spina bifida present with a protrusion of the spinal cord through an unfused opening, which to an uneducated eye may be misinterpreted. Milder forms present with a tuft of hair or dimple in the area of the lower back, but the cord doesn't protrude. Another more rare disorder is progeria. Traits of progeria present themselves during the first few months of an infant's life. Earlier symptoms include a failure to thrive and scleroderma-like skin condition. Additional characteristics such as limited growth, full body hair loss, a distinctive appearance marked by a small face with a shallow recessed jaw and a pinched nose become notable as the children age to around 18 to 24 months old and will go on to develop wrinkled skin, kidney failure, loss of eyesight, and cardiovascular problems a hardening and tightening of the skin on the trunks and extremities, giving them a fragile, elderly appearance. The head of this child with this condition is usually large in relation to the body, with a narrow, wrinkled face and a beak nose, according to WebMD. So, I mean, these are to a T fitting the bill. This is definitely a possibility. It's very much more likely than your child was snatched by fairy magic. (laughs) You're listening to the Prescribed Films Podcast Network, home to hundreds of hours of free podcast entertainment. The shows on this network all have a common goal, providing you with the best discussions about movies and other forms of entertainment media. The PFPN hopes to fill your ear holes with audio joy. Visit our website with links to all the other amazing shows at www.thepfpn.com. Thanks for listening. Just throw back to the legends of changelings and tie together some of the traits we've been discussing. A WordPress article posted in 2014 called Ireland's Most Sinister Superstition, the changeling describes how a previously perfect baby would suddenly fall ill and fail to thrive. Conversely, their appetite may become insatiable and they will literally eat their new family out of house and home, but no matter how much they eat, they remain sickly and thin. The replacement baby is likely to be deformed or have strange features. They may cry constantly and generally be thought to be unpleasant. Okay, so that kind of triggered a thought. Are you familiar with the period of purple crying? About everyone who has had a baby should have been told about this. So according to medical literature, it begins about two weeks of age and can continue until a baby reaches up to four months old. The common characteristic of this phase are described by using the acronym PURPLE, P-U-R-P-L-E, P, meaning the peak of crying, meaning your baby may cry more each week, mostly in month two and less in months three to five. U, standing for unexpected, crying comes and goes with no explanation. R, resists soothing, baby will cry no matter what you do. P, pain like face, 
Baby can look like it's in pain when it isn't. L. Long lasting. Baby can cry as much as five hours a day or more. And E. Evening. Baby may cry more in the afternoon or evening. Hmm, that sounds a little bit familiar, doesn't it? The word period is emphasized in the educational material to remind parents that the crying will end. There is hope. So don't put a hot shovel on your baby's butt. My first one's lucky that she wasn't (laughs) born during this time. That is not a joke because that period of purple crying describes her to a T. Mm -hmm. She was pretty brutal. Oh, she's sweet now, but not then. These changeling children face great risk from others outside of their own families, often from the ill-conceived notion that these people are acting in the interest of the greater good. Looking back with the perspective that people like us hold, where even people with little to no medical training have even a basic knowledge of some medical conditions and explanations, it's easy to forget how profoundly superstition-based these people's lives were. To them, the disabilities and illnesses of these children were unnatural and inhuman. These superstitious beliefs allowed people a way to combat this perceived adversary as opposed to being helpless spectators in the suffering of their children and their families, as well as giving meaning to an otherwise inexplicable and irrational condition. The best way they managed to confront this enemy head-on was to reveal their existence and cast them out. Immersed in the rivers or placed at the margin of coastal tides, stood on hot coals or hung over fires, exposed in freezing weather, bathed in poisonous foxglove essence, beaten, threatened, and subjected to forms of exorcism. These babies and children sometimes survived, sometimes not. Suspicion of fairy magic was seen as a legitimate defense against the charge of murder as late as the end of the 19th century. So if you didn't want your kid, you could just say that they, you thought it was a fairy. You, you suspected it was a fairy. Mm-hmm. Oh, or your wife. And that was fine. It's fine. Okay. So aside from actual illnesses or disorders in these poor babies, let's look at some of the other alternative explanations for such sudden changes in babies after their births. Since most of the poems and legends focus on the mother of the child and her discovery of the changelings, let's take on that angle. Even in this modern age with the advances that have been made in healthcare and health awareness and education, for every 1 to 2,000 births, 1 to 2 percent of postpartum mothers experience a sudden onset of psychosis within two weeks of delivery. Symptoms of postpartum psychosis are listed by postpartum.net to include delusions or strange beliefs, hallucinations, feeling very irritated, hyperactivity, decreased need for or inability to sleep, paranoia and suspiciousness, and rapid mood swings. That's like me every morning. I'm not a morning person. Because we have pre- pre-coffee psychosis. Pre-coffee psychosis. That's... That's pretty That's much That's my right. official diagnosis. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and probably pre-breakfast psychosis because I wake up hangry. Needs my brekkie. <laughs> because symptoms of psychosis include delusional thinking and irrational judgment, there is always the risk of danger to the women suffering the condition or those around her, including her newborn child. www.ppdil.org details two recent cases of PPD, or postpartum depression, which occurred in Texas, both of which resulted in unfortunate incidents and received nationwide attention. The more recent case, a woman, Deanna Lejeune Laney, said God told her to kill her two young sons on Mother's Day weekend in 2003. Her boys, ages 8 and 6, had their heads bashed in with rocks. I remember that. Her third child, a 14-month-old boy, was found bloody in his crib and was hospitalized. According to an article from CanadianCRC.com, after the killings, Laney made a 911 call on her cell phone and spoke in a very calm manner and matter-of-fact way. She told a dispatcher, I've killed my boys. A sheriff's department spokeswoman said deputies arrived at the new Chapel Hill home about seven miles outside of Tyler at 12.52 a.m. on Saturday. When officers arrived, they entered the house and found Aaron in his crib, wounded but still breathing. Laney was not there but continued to talk calmly on the phone. Officers found the woman wearing bloody clothes in a wooded area about 100 yards behind their house according to the sheriff. Laney described where her other two children could be found, but refused to go there herself. Her husband was apparently asleep inside the house during the attack because he came walking out in his nightclothes, the sheriff said. Obviously, postpartum depression or psychosis was presented as a defense, but it was doubted 
as it had been 14 months since she had given birth. That's awful. The next one's a little bit more well-known. Oh, I hate this one too. Yeah. In the other case, Andrea Yates drowned her five children one by one in a bathtub on June 20th, 2001, during the hour between the time that her husband left for work and her mother-in-law arrived at their home. She is serving a life term in prison for her crimes. Her plea of innocence by reason of insanity was rejected. Biography.com's page on Andrea Yates details that throughout her trial, her husband Rusty Yates stood by his wife with the insistence that it was a mental illness and not Andrea that was responsible for the killings of their five children. She pleaded innocence by reason of insanity, citing postpartum psychosis, but in March 2002, a jury rejected the insanity defense and found Yates guilty of first-degree murder, sentencing her to life in prison with eligibility for parole in 40 years. However, on January 6, 2005, the Texas Court of Appeals reversed the convictions. On July 26, 2006, Andrea Yates was found not guilty by reason of insanity. But she is in, like, a mental health facility. She's not free. In the rare fairy tale in which it is an adult who had been switched for a changeling, men were sometimes influenced by drink or song, seduced by a lovely woman, and were led away by a fairy. In these cases, the man may not even have been replaced by a changeling, but kidnapped and disappeared forever. Or he went to the 7-Eleven for a pack of smokes and just didn't come back. Yeah, so... I wonder why it is necessarily that, you know, the men are replaced. They just disappear because they just... Same reason they disappear now. <laughs> well, yeah. So it's just women rationalizing their husbands leaving by blaming it on being kidnapped by fairies. Or because... people like the neighbors trying to console her and say that that's probably what happened instead of he left her for his side chick. Yeah, exactly. Huh. Did you see that thing on, I think it was on Facebook, where the kid was like drawing a diagram in his class and he had on one side his house... And then a straight line, and then it was a store, and the store was one mile from his house. And he says the average male walks five miles per hour from the house to the store, one mile. So why is it taking my dad 18 years to come back home? <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> That's I was like, oh. <laughs> That's so sad. It was sad. It's terrible. Back in the old days, they did rationalize things a little bit differently than we do now. So, I mean, to them, this was reasonable. To us, not so much. As we discussed previously, it has been evident in most of these tales that the female gender is considered far more valuable in the eyes of the fairy folk, focusing on women who are more vulnerable to such attacks as they are unbaptized or unchurched. Most importantly, women who have recently given birth, as they were needed to help the fairy population continue their family lines, perhaps with stronger genetics, and were forcibly wed to a male and forced to bear his children. Other legends suggest that a woman who is nursing or pregnant is most, is most valued for her precious milk, which is fed to the young fairies. Like we said before, the telltale sign of this type of changeling is the sudden personality change from a happy, loving mother and a wife to a cold, mean-spirited bitch. According to lore, it may be the children who are the first to discover that their mother is not their mother, which may yet be another superstitious motive for a mother to kill her own children. It wasn't mommy. It was the fairy. According to D.L. Ashleman in 1997, however, some aspects of changeling folklore demonstrate a more anti-female stance, focusing their attention on primarily male babies, which could imply that the fairies, elves, trolls, and devils have little use for a female child. According to some stories, boys were even disguised as girls until they were 10 or 11 years old to throw off any supernatural entity which may be on the hunt for a young boy. Other causes for these sudden personality changes, aside from postpartum depression or psychosis, could include traumatic brain injury. According to Brian Greenwald, PhD, psychiatric issues including hallucinations, delusions, are more common after traumatic brain injury. The risk for new onset of psychiatric illness after a brain injury goes on for a long time and can be seen with any severity of traumatic brain injury. According to the Mayo Clinic, the following TBI complications, such as seizures, called post-traumatic epilepsy, may occur. Cerebrospinal fluid buildup in the brain, or hydrocephalus, causing increased pressure and swelling in the brain, blood vessel damage that could lead to stroke, blood clots, or other problems which may affect a person's behavior and personality may occur after TBI as well. Imagine being subjected to the torture of trying to cast out a changeling after having already suffered an injury related to an accidental injury or fall. Also think about it from this perspective. 
At the time when these beliefs were prevalent, do you think that it was uncommon, especially in destitute households, for a woman to be struck or beaten by her husband? So after like an injury, you know, because in a lot of these stories, they start off in houses that aren't necessarily happy households to begin with. Right. So that kind of leads to the likelihood of depression and stuff after the changes of having a baby or things like that. Well, having a baby adds to the pressure that already was there financially. Exactly. Puts a lot of pressure on the husband. So husband beats his wife and then she suffers some sort of injury as a result. And either the suspicion of her being a changeling based on her personality changes or symptoms of her injury cause her to become suspicious of her own child. Right. Psychosis due to seizure disorders is alternatively a cause for sudden changes. Schizophrenia-like psychosis occurs 6 to 12 times more frequently in patients with seizure disorders than in the general population. Remember, symptoms such as seizures were also explained by demon possession and would not be immune to having been swapped by a changeling or suspicion of having been swapped by a changeling. Taking all of these illnesses into account and the risk of them going untreated, that may be the possible explanation for the reported short life span of a changeling. Changelings do not live long in the mortal world. They usually shrivel up and die within the first two or three years of their human existence. But why? Aside from having been subjected to dangerous tests, which often result in the death of these children. The descriptions of the odd and suspicious behaviors of changeling children commonly found in folklore are honestly pretty basic child behaviors. Frequent crying, limited speech, laughing to themselves, and being interested in unusual objects. That's me now. Right? For some reason, parents perceive these seemingly normal behaviors as odd or supernatural and counter the behaviors with abuse and neglect. Is it possible, then, that otherwise normal healthy baby behaviors change as a result of their parents' treatment of them? What? Some studies suggest that children who are neglected or rejected are more likely to display antisocial behavior or behave aggressively and may exhibit a number of cognitive deficits such as impaired logical reasoning, according to Roy F. Baumeister and C. Nathan DeWall. Neglect can also result in the decline of self-control or impulse control, which causes these children to be rejected further, not only by their parents, but by their peers as well. Bruce Perry, a pioneer in the research on childhood brain development and children in crisis, says that the brain of infants and young children are sensitive and malleable. For children, especially young children, traumatic events may change the very framework of the brain and its development. According to these studies, as well as clinical experience, childhood abuse as well as neglect adversely affects a child's emotional development, according to Carol McBride, PhD's The Legacy of Distorted Love. Most of the time, we prefer to play devil's advocate. And we take the side that assumes the paranormal or supernatural element is real or true. However, in cases such as these where we all are aware of the perceptive differences based on societal norms, level of education, and understanding of people living in an entirely different time, it's difficult to take that side. While the understanding of illness or genetic abnormalities is relatively new and developing every day, with advances in medical practice, the existence of disorders themselves is not limited to our time. The reasonable and rational argument in the cases of fairies and changeling folklore is that the legends were likely created in an effort to bring meaning and understanding to a situation that created fear in a people who had very simple and basic understanding of the world around them. Let us know what you think. Well, that's it for this week's episode of Bigfoot for Breakfast. Thanks for checking us out. We hope you enjoyed listening and keep on coming back for more. Don't forget to subscribe to our podcast on whichever app you listen from and leave us a rating and a review. This not only helps our show out tremendously, but it helps you get in the running for some awesome free merchandise like a t-shirt or a free glitter mug. Congratulations once again to our February contest winner, Christina Emmert. Thanks again for sharing us with your friends, for listening and interacting. Keep an eye out for our announcements on new contests and how to win because we love giving stuff away and we're giving you so many ways to win the things so win the things if you're not into free stuff but you want to interact with us anyway you can reach us on instagram twitter facebook tiktok or by email at bigfootforbreakfast at outlook.com or you can call our voicemail and leave us a message the number is 641-812-2635. We love getting feedback on what you love about the show, what you want to hear, and what you think we can do better. If you have any cool stories, we love to hear them too. 
Once again, thanks for being here with us and please come again.